Stepping into 2017, the US-China relationship faces increasing uncertainty and complexity. Relations between the world's two largest economies are entering into a new chapter that presents both unprecedented opportunities as well as challenges ahead. While the US reconsiders its domestic and international strategy, on the other side of the Pacific, China is dealing with its own economic slowdown after decades of rapid expansion. To provide an overview of the macroeconomic environment and to also share a business perspective of the relationship, I am honored to introduce you Mr. William Yu, Ms. Elizabeth Harrington, and Mr. Chen Kong. It's a great honor for me to start the opening section with William and Elizabeth um, on, on the 2017 Wu Conference to share with you our views and observations on the China inbound investments into, China, into the U.S. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I think the U.S.-China relationship is at, at a very interesting intersection you know, right now, right? So we have President Trump um, um, promising a few months ago that he would name China a currency manipulator right, in, in the first day in office. But now last week, he said, hey, China is not a currency manipulator. Right? And we also have President Trump you know, claiming a few months ago that he would try to impose a 45% tariff on imports from China. And now the administration's view is that you know, they need China to be on our good side so they could help us to handle the North Korea situation. Mm -hmm. right? So certainly it's, it's all interesting development. And on top of all these political developments, you know, we have the tax reform going on in the US. And certainly for any business, including the inbound investors from China, where right, tax would affect them directly. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a great, I think we had a great time seeing all these great developments, but also a lot of uncertainties around these developments, right? So in the next like 30 minutes or so, uh, we will go over you know, a, a macro environment uh, uh, observation on the China's economies. And then Elizabeth is going to share with us in some details on exactly, you know, uh, for the Chinese inbound investments, investors, what they are doing and why they are doing what they are doing. And then I'm going to end the section with a brief introduction on the tax reform just to give the audience some, some sense on how the tax reform might in, impact the, China, uh, the, the inbound investors from China. So with that, I'm going to turn it to William. Right. right. Uh, thank you, uh, Chen. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor to be here to talk about China's macroeconomy and its investment in the United States. So let me begin with uh, China's economy overview. Uh, so recently, we heard that uh, China's uh, 2017 first quarter GDP growth rate is 6.9%. So many people are kind of excited about this relative good number. However, I'm pretty cautious um, because I believe uh, a big portion of the growth uh, is coming from this credit growth and leverage, which continue uh, this uh, real estate bubble, uh, continue this overinvestment and uh, the manufacturing overcapacity. So here, uh, let me show you this chart uh, provided by INF last year. So the, the data is uh, the credit to non-financial corporation as a percentage of GDP. The horizontal axis is the GDP per capita. So you can see by and large, uh, these uh, uh, couples of uh, countries, uh, the richer the country, the higher the GDP per capita, they tend to use more credit. Yeah, and China, as you can see, is around here. So compared to its peer, China used much more credit uh, than its uh, uh, similar uh, uh, GDP per capita country. And on the right, you can also see uh, the credit growth for the country in the past, like Japan, Thailand, and Spain, uh, before the financial uh, real estate bubble and after mass. So you can see, uh, I'm kind of worried about the trajectory of China's uh, current uh, credit growth uh, following similar paths. So the bottom line is, I think that China's runaway credit growth uh, is not sustainable. So the risk uh, to its economy 
I think it's higher and higher every day. So how about United States economy? Yeah. So many people believe uh, uh, President Trump, our President Trump is the biggest risk to our economy. Um, I think uh, <laughs> the Trump administration's uh, deregulation and corporate tax cut and reform uh, will be a big contribution to our GDP economic growth. So, um, so recently I, I have done a simple research by using uh, OECD certified countries data uh, with different kind of corporate tax rate uh, to answer this question, will Trump's corporate tax cut boost US economy? So right now we know uh, the plan is to reduce our 35% uh, federal tax rate to 20% or even further 15%. So based on my calculation by controlling all other, a lot of factors, the conclusion I get is uh, if we can get this passed, the US GDP growth rate could possibly increase by 0.9 percentage point. That's huge. It means like our 2% growth rate will become 2.9%. So it's almost uh, increased by one third. So that's good news. Um, so right now, let's talk about the trade, uh, trade imbalance between United States and China. And in fact, that is the main reason, one of the main reasons uh, Donald Trump got elected uh, president. So here, um, let's take a look. This chart shows the, uh, the major trade deficit country within the United States um, in terms of a percentage of US GDP. You can see uh, many countries, Japan, Blue Line, you know, uh, in the 80s was very high and recently uh, it's slowing down. And China is outstanding, the red line over there, outstanding. So it's almost like 2% of our GDP. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's a big number, it's a huge imbalance. So right now, uh, fortunately, as a uh, 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 previous uh, speaker said, uh, we had a good start uh, from the summit between President Trump and Xi. So right now, Trump administration's uh, idea is try to reduce this trade imbalance by increase U.S. exports to China, rather than by reducing Chinese imports into the United States. I think that is the right way to do that. Uh, the other way to do this is uh, this, foreign direct investment. So for country like China, trade surplus country, if they can invest directly to the trade deficit country like the United States, by doing so, it will create jobs, it will boost economic growth. And we have seen this kind of thing happening, uh, especially uh, last year, we have seen this kind of uh, FDI increase by uh, uh, triple, you know, from 15 billion to 45 billion. I think that is a, a right direction. And later on, I think Chen and Elizabeth will talk about this uh, in more detail. Um, and the majority of the investment is here, is coming here, mm -hmm. California. It's about one third in 2016. So very good for California economy. All right. So right now, um, the downside of this kind of surging China's uh, FDI into the United States is what we've seen uh, in this chart, the rapidly declining uh, foreign reserve uh, over the past two years from the peak of four trillion to recently three trillion dollars. And because of that, uh, looks very scary. So Chinese government imposed this uh, 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 more stringent uh, capital control at the end of uh, last year. So, um, so it seems like uh, uh, capital control has some kind of effect to stabilize this kind of uh, leakage of the foreign uh, reserve. But personally, I don't think this is a good policy, you know, uh, capital control, because uh, I think it is against the China's goal to become a bigger and more advanced player in our today's uh, globalized economy and financial world. And it is also deviating from the promise China made to IMF to let uh, Chinese currency, renminbi, uh, becoming the reserve currency. So, um, so, so let's talk about this next slide. Um, 
So this is the uh, uh, exchange rate, renminbi exchange rate against uh, US dollar. So the vertical line is uh, uh, how many Chinese yuan each US dollar can exchange. So if you see the value going down, it means uh, dollar become uh, uh, depreciating and renminbi become appreciating. So we can see from 2005 uh, all the way to 2015, we can see a very strong renminbi appreciation reflecting uh, China's uh, economic growth. However, um, <laughs> everything changed in the summer of 2015. We see uh, overnight uh, many Chinese and investors realize that uh, a strong Chinese economy and currency is gone. And what we are going to see is this kind of weaker uh, currency. And indeed, it happened uh, for the next uh, two years. So luckily, uh, we see over the past several months, uh, Chinese currency become stabilized. Probably part of that is due to this uh, capital control. Um, so I got a lot of uh, 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 questions you know, over the past several months uh, uh, regarding what will happen for the, uh, uh, this uh, Chinese uh, exchange rate currency. Um, I, I always say it's hard to predict because it's basically controlled by uh, 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 People's Bank, Chinese government. But I always say that it is the best interest for China right now at this uh, critical moment to maintain stable or even stronger uh, currency. Why? Because you can see that actually there's a, like a chicken and egg thing. Over the past two years, the weakened uh, currency drive the expectation that more Chinese money flowing out to the country because they believe if they keep holding their asset as a Chinese currency, their assets value will go down. So they kind of move, move out their uh, capital uh, compared to otherwise. So, so this kind of capital outflow and uh, depreciation become like a feature cycle, you know, uh, driving together. So luckily, uh, uh, China uh, made this kind of uh, strong, determined uh, uh, nation over the past mo uh, several months to maintain this kind of uh, currency. I think it's a good sign uh, for two reasons. Number one is to kind of uh, reduce this kind of expectation of further depreciation. Number two, as we mentioned before, we got a big problem of trade imbalance between United States and China. So if we see further depreciation of currency, Chinese yuan, which might help exports, but it definitely will worsen the uh, pretty good, right now, pretty good relationship between President Trump and Xi. So I think uh, 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 it's very crucial for China uh, to maintain uh, this kind of strong and stable currency. And so that's my expectation, you know, because I believe Chinese government are very smart. They know uh, this is their best interest. But I'm not suggesting then to do so by imposing capital control. As I said before, that is not a good policy. So you say, how should, how should they do that uh, uh, to maintain this kind of stable uh, currency? The answer is that foreign reserve. China still had gigantic foreign reserve. Right now it's $3 trillion. So I think it's, uh, they can basically do this is uh, for whatever demand of capital outflow, the people's bank just provide the US dollar to them. Okay. So three trillion become two trillion to become one trillion, it doesn't matter because that is actually the basic goal of China building this huge foreign reserve in the beginning to try to maintain stability you know, when there's a capital outflow. So I think right now it's time, if there's a capital outflow need, then the central bank should just provide the capital to those uh, investors. Anyway, so conclusion here. Number one, China's mounting credit and debt is a risk to its economy. And China's uh, foreign direct investment, business or individual in the United States are good for three reasons. Number one, they can diversify their wealth to reduce the risk. Number two, right now Trump's pro-business policy such as the corporate tax cut will make uh, United States uh, investment environment more attractive. 
Number three, by doing this FDI uh, investment in the United States, you will create jobs and mitigate this problem of the trade imbalance uh, between these uh, two largest economies in the world. And number three, I want to say is uh, a stable uh, renminbi is desirable for both countries. All right, so thank you very much. I'm going to turn it to <laughs> you. First of all, I would like to thank the Wu family and Deans Allard and Deans Olian for inviting Who Run Report to join you again this year and my partners at PricewaterhouseCoopers and Cathay uh, Bank. We are very, very honored to be with you at this important conference um, at an important time. I would like to just quickly explain who Who Run Report is. Who Run Report is China's leading business magazine. It's the Forbes and Fortune magazine of China. And we have a multi-division uh, media platform, which is our magazines, uh, our online media, our events, and various programs. But most of all, Who Run Report is a research institution. It was founded in 1999 by Rupert Hugeworth, who was at that time a partner with Arthur Anderson in Shanghai. And Rupert began to observe, as we did at PricewaterhouseCoopers, that suddenly, after only five years of private business in China, we were having very high net worth entrepreneurs come into our offices and ask us how to do things. One of those people was Wan Jingling of Wanda, whom Price Waterhouse had the honor of helping design uh, US shopping centers in China. Another was Jack Ma, to whom I lost my number two guy on my team, went to work for Jack. <laughs> he did very well. <laughs> so what's unique about the Who Run Report is that we're a research-based organization, not a journalistic organization. And we began studying China's entrepreneurs in 1997 and 99, which was the early, early days of the growth of private business and entrepreneurship in China. We had the incredible good fortune to actually work with these people and get to know them over the years. So what's unique about the Who Run Report is not that we actually report on these people, but we know them and are trusted friends and advisors to them for many years. And so what I'm gonna share with you today is some of the Who Run Report's extensive research on many, many topics in China. But one of the most important ones is outbound Chinese investment, particularly to the United States. And what I'm gonna do is kind of add to who are the entrepreneurs that are doing these outbound investments and why are they doing them and what can we expect going forward? The growth of wealth in China has been extraordinary, and some of the faces on this uh, slide you will recognize. Wan Jingling of Wanda, Jack Ma of Alibaba, Pony Ma of Tencent. Uh, one you might not recognize is Mr. Yao of Baoning. Uh, he's a, a takeover specialist. But the most important point here is that there are now over 2,000 people in China that we can document that have a net worth of over 300 million US dollars. We believe that there are probably twice that many, another 4,000 that we cannot even document. So the wealth in China is enormous and it's grown tremendously in the last 20 years, particularly the last 10 years. There are now 754 Chinese billionaires in the world, and that represents 34% of the global rich. 594 of those billionaires live in China, and they represent 27% of the rich worldwide. Most important point here is there are now more billionaires in China than there are in the United States. There are 535 billionaires in the US, which makes us number two. The majority of the Chinese billionaires still live in the mainland, but we actually have eight of them living here in the United States and several in Los Angeles itself. Beijing has overtaken New York to be the billionaire capital of the world, and the US is right behind China 
as the destination for billionaires worldwide. And that really, frankly, has to do with our open economy and growth opportunities. Most people don't know, we've been seeing a lot of slides talking about the growth and wealth in China in recent years. The wealth in China has increased six times since the financial crisis in 2008. And the majority of that is due to outbound investment and global expansion. There has been a tremendously dynamic group of people on the Who Run Rich list over the last 18 years since we've been publishing it. The number one has changed many times. Uh, I'd just like to touch on a few of these people. Number one this year and for several years in the past is Wan Jingling, chairman of Wanda, who has major investments here in Los Angeles, both in real estate and in the entertainment industry. His net worth last year was $32 billion US. The majority of that was in real estate, but he did something very dramatic last summer. He delisted his real estate company, Wanda Commercial Real Estate, in Hong Kong, and he's moving it back to the mainland China, and it will be relisted in China, and will probably do an IPO in 2018. Why is he doing that? because Chinese investors will value the company higher than global investors or global investors based out of Hong Kong. They expect a 10% premium to be added to the value of the company just by shifting the listing back to the mainland of China. And that obviously has some nationalistic uh, overtones as well. But when that listing is done, that will probably boost Wan Jingling's net worth to $50 billion maybe more. So he continues to be a key player. Uh, but number two, and they go back and forth every year, is Jack Ma, who also has major investments here in the United States. Alibaba was listed on the New York Stock Exchange in 2014. Uh, we believe that Jack Ma is going to do an IPO of Ant Financial, which will revolutionize the financial industry worldwide. We expect that that IPO will be done toward the end of 2017. And when that happens, it's predicted that that will uh, raise Jack Ma's net worth to $60 billion. So Wan Jingling and Jack Ma are going to be neck to neck this year for one and two again. Other people who are very key in this equation are Pony Ma, the chairman of Tencent. Pony's net worth is about $28 billion, but he is really the Bill Gates of China. He is in the process of giving 21 billion of that net worth away. So his focus is really on philanthropy. We talked about uh, Mr. Ya, who is the takeover king of China. Uh, he owns a company called Bao Ning. He's done something that's really gonna revolutionize financial services and financial investment. He's building his wealth not in manufacturing, not in real estate, but in financial investment and assets. He's just taken a major position in Vanka, one of the key um, real estate companies here in China and the US. So it's, we see a shift going on. Most of the people who were number one or in our top 100, 26% of the billionaires came from manufacturing. Only 15% came from real estate. Most people think it's real estate, but real estate is really number two. The growth area is obviously IT, and Alibaba is a leader in that, but what's fascinating is it's not really just IT, it's the revolution of retailing. It's sales of products worldwide, commodities and consumer products online instead of bricks and mortar store. That's really what's driving Alibaba. So retailing and IT are gonna be big drivers. They're currently about 12% of the uh, net worth of people in China, but we think they're gonna grow up. And the other area that's going to grow, uh, like Mr. Yao, is the shift of emphasis to investment and financial services. A Couple of other people on this list I'd just like to point out. Um, William Ding Li, of NetEase, uh, who at age 45 has jumped up to the top 10 on our rich list. Uh, and gaming and online technology are a critical area there. He actually has a lot of interest here in Los Angeles. 
uh, the lady next to his picture, uh, Madame Zhang Yen, the chairwoman of Nine Dragons Paper, one of the top women entrepreneurs in the world, also has property and residence here in Los Angeles. So LA is much more an epicenter for all of these people than many folks realize. Um, I want to give a nod to China's women billionaires. I'm incredibly proud of them. My dear friend, Madam Chen Li Hua, is the chairwoman of Fuwa Real Estate, and she is the richest woman in China and the richest woman in the world. Uh, Two-thirds of the women billionaires in the world are Chinese, and almost all of them are self-made. Uh, right behind Madam Chen Li Hua, is a, uh, a newcomer, uh, Madame Zhu, who is the chairwoman of Lens, and she does all of the, uh, the touchpad screens that you see for iPads and in elevators all over the world. So huge opportunity for women entrepreneurs in China. Uh, I wanna see one of your pictures on this slide sometime in the next few years. Um, the, the growing tide is, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs who are in the millennial category, under 40 or even under 30. Um, one of the famous ones is Yan Hao, uh, who is the uh, now the chairman of Pacific Ch Construction at age 31. Jack Wong, who is the chairman of the Hakim Group, and uh, Frank Wang Tao, who is the head of DJL. What's really interesting here is that only one third of the millennial billionaires are self-made versus 95% of the first generation and the majority of women billionaires are also self-made. So we're starting to see the first generation of people who are inheriting their parents' companies, but at very young ages. Um, Mr. Howe is 31 years of age, a really bright, delightful, capable young man. Uh, another example would be Kelly Zhang, who is the daughter of uh, Chairman Zhang of Wahaha, China's largest beverage company. And Kelly actually went to school here at UCLA. And she is increasingly taking over the day-to-day -day management of her dad's company, Wahaha. So we're gonna see a new trend in millennials. Some will be self-made and some will be the second generation leaders of family companies. The big push, as everyone has already said, is outbound investment in Chinese companies going global for two reasons. One, they're looking for the growth and the diversification. And very importantly, they are really looking to build global brands. That doesn't get talked as much these days uh, as the currency issues, but it's a very big part of the strategy. And the US is the number one destination for outbound investment. As we've already said, Chinese investment in the U.S. has tripled in the last year to 45 billion, but it's up 10 times over 2,000. Why do people come to the U.S.? Growth, security, and education. So many of Chinese leaders, uh, I'm sure people in this audience are students, uh, family members being sent here for education, and also for tourism. So there are many, many reasons why the investment is coming here. The other big change that we're seeing is what people are investing in. And there's a big diversification. Uh, before 2008, the majority of investment in the US was by state-owned enterprises, and it was in resources, particularly fuel and energy. Uh, since the economic crash in 2008, it shifted over to 80% of the investment now is by entrepreneurs and private companies. That's why knowing who the people are, what their ambitions and drivers are, is so important to predict what's going to happen going forward. Also, the industries have changed. Uh, we're seeing much more investment now, not just in real estate, but in entertainment, in IT, in financial services, in other areas. So let's talk about the really fun part who's doing what and why, and what happened in U.S. deals in 2016. Um, these are just a few examples, and time permitting, we can talk about a lot more. One of the big ones is Anbang uh, Insurance Company, and, or I'm sorry, not Anbang, we'll talk about um, um, HNA, which is really Hainan Airlines first. 
they have recently bought both the Hilton and the Carlson Hotel chain uh, for $6.9 billion. And another less obvious one is Ingram Micro for another $6.7 billion. Uh, Hainan Airlines started out as the first private airline in China serving Western China. And they've really grown and diversified into really a global tourism company. So it makes perfect sense for them to be buying other airlines, which they're also doing, and hotel chains, because that fits in perfectly with their global tourism strategy. Ingram Micro is not so obvious, but it's a high-tech logistics company. As Hainan Airlines go around the world, they're carrying freight as well as passengers, very often on backhaul. So that was the reason for that one. Uh, one of the other big, big investments in uh, the recent years is Anbang Insurance. And this one is not you know, quite so obvious because what they have built, what bought was strategic hotels which they bought from the Blackstone Group because the chairman of Anbang happens to be good friends with Steve Schwartzman, uh, and Steve is the chairman of the, um, uh, the Blackstone Group. So that investment was made strictly as diversification, but they see the growth of tourism in the United States, so they thought it was a great way to diversify. Uh, Anbang also bought the uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel about a year ago in New York, for $2 billion. Those of us who love staying at the Waldorf are very sad that it's now closed and it's going to be turned primarily into condominiums. Uh, but that's a much better source of cash flow than operating hotels, so that's why that one was done. Another great one is Hire, which has been in the United States for many years and was one of the early Chinese companies to set up manufacturing in the U.S. And many of you who are students, I'm sure, are very familiar with the higher mini refrigerators for, uh, for student dorm rooms. It was an incredibly smart strategy. When higher came into the U.S., they were huge in China, totally new to the U.S., and they picked a niche product to establish themselves, and they did some very good deals with major retailers like Walmart. And they really got the business started with the famous dorm uh, refrigerators. Hire currently, in spite of their size and manufacturing facilities in North Carolina, only has a 1% share of the U.S. market. Seven or eight years ago, they attempted to buy Maytag, which really needed to be bought. The deal was blocked by the U.S. government on grounds of national security, which no one could quite explain why a washer and dryer were going to be a threat to national <laughs> security. But frankly, it was early protectionism. Uh, attitudes have changed, and GE is very happy about the deal that they've done with Hire. But why did Hire do it? GE has a 14% share of the appliance market in the United States. They, they manage uh, large products, refrigerators, ovens, which will allow Hire to take all of its expertise in China, use it in the US, and interestingly, they've just set up a micro-manufacturing facility, which is going to make new products like bullet juicers, small home appliances. So very interesting deal, and we think going to be very successful. Uh, Alibaba has made a number of very strategic investments, while Wanda has been going after uh, big entertainment companies. Alibaba has taken a slightly different strategy. They simply made an investment in a joint venture with Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, but a very, very prestigious deal, but in a low-key way. Interestingly enough, uh, through Alipay and Alibaba, they have done an investment in Pizza Hut and Kentucky Fried Chicken in China, not in the US. Why would they do that? Food delivery online. Uh, Ant Financial is going to be the next breakthrough. It will really revolutionize money transfers around the world and microfinancing. And Ant is a spinoff of Alipay and Alibaba. And as I mentioned earlier, that deal is expected to IPO in late 2017, early 2018, and will have a value of about $60 billion. It's one of the most anticipated IPOs in the world today. Another one, just very quickly, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Uber here in uh, Los Angeles. Didi is the Chinese equivalent of Uber, and they've been going head to head in China fighting. But Didi did a very smart thing. They went out and got investors from Tencent, from Alibaba, and they raised more money and they basically crushed Uber <laughs> in China. It's like, hi, we're bigger than you are. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so that was a very strategic investment there, but it will, it will make Didi the leader uh, in, in online transportation in China. Wanda, uh, as I'm sure you all know, Wanda did the deal with Legendary about a year ago for $3.5 billion, and Chairman uh, Wang was here in Los Angeles in October of this year introducing his new film production center at Qingdao, and the government is going to give Hollywood companies a 40% discount to produce their films in Qingdao, which will in turn give them greater access to the China box office. Currently only about, I forget, 20, 32 or 26 films are, US films are allowed into China every year. But if a US production is produced in Qingdao, they'll get a 40% discount and they will get access to distribution in the Chinese market. Um, Chairman Wang had a little setback in the last few weeks because of the currency regulations. The Chinese government suddenly decided that entertainment was no longer a strategic investment and refused to approve the $1 billion deal that Chairman Wang was in the process of doing uh, with Dick Clark Productions, which owns Golden Globes and a number of other properties. Um, after lengthy discussion, and he was also facing a letter that was sent to Congress in October by various U.S. government officials stating that they were concerned about essentially propaganda, uh, Chinese soft power influencing the, the message about China coming into U.S. and world households. So the combination of pushback by the U.S. government, but more importantly, pushback by the Chinese regulators, uh, SAFE, Foreign State Administration of Foreign Exchange, kill that deal. And Wang Jingling, uh, being the very perceptive person that he is, announced that he's changed his strategy and he's now going to be focusing on domestic investment and health care in China. Very interesting. Uh, Fosan is another one that's been much in the news lately for a couple of reasons. Fosan has made major investments in the United States, uh, notably Ironshore Insurance, which interestingly enough, after owning for less than a year, they've decided to sell again at a profit, but they're in and out of that deal very quickly. Some of the reason for that may be that Chairman Guo of uh, Fosan has been involved in helping the Chinese government resolve some of the uh, corruption issues in China. He uh, was invited to have a conversation with Chinese government leaders about a year ago to provide insight and information on the anti-corruption issues. And a number of members of, of his board have just resigned recently. Uh, and he seems to be back on good terms with the government, but things are changing at Fosan uh, because of the internal anti-corruption issues. But what about the deals that haven't worked? We talked about uh, the situation with Wanda and Dick Clark Productions, but another one that wasn't in the press very much but tells a real story. As part of Anbang's purchase of strategic hotels, one hotel got dropped out of the property. And that hotel happened to be uh, the Del Coronado down in San Diego. The official reason being for its being dropped was that it was a historic U.S. landmark. The reason it wasn't talked about so much was of its proximity to the U.S. naval base in San Diego. So uh, not, not all the reasons for these deals getting changed makes the news. So we could go on for quite a long time about these deals. There are many others to talk about, but that kind of gives you a picture of the landscape. But what has all this done for the U.S. economy? A very quick, very important point. In 2015, there were 1,900 Chinese companies in the U.S. After this infusion of capital, there are now 3,200 
uh, Chinese companies in the U.S. almost double in one year. That's very profound. 140,000 U.S. jobs have been created, and many of you in this room are part of that. Uh, over 300,000 Chinese students in the U.S., which create 12 billion to the U.S. economy. We've already talked about the balance of trade, which is uh, way out of line uh, on the Chinese side. So what's going to happen going forward? There's obviously a lot of room for additional investment in the U.S. We've talked about President Xi and President Trump. People anticipated a really rocky meeting. It ended up going very well, partly because the interest was deflected to Syria. But I thought Xi Jinping really said the most important thing, which is there are a thousand reasons to get the U.S.-China relationship right and not one to get it wrong. President Trump's reaction was, that's very interesting. <laughs> and, and we've made a lot of progress. Uh, what they agreed to do is have a 100-day plan and a meeting in the fall. Everyone thinks that it ended up being a very good meeting because basically they got to know each other without discussing any really substantial issues. But obviously Trump wants to trade support with North Korea uh, for favorable trade terms. So that's probably a good trade off for all of us. Um, we've talked about what are the barriers going forward here. The biggest, biggest barrier, there's a huge appetite for continued investment in the United States. The big, big barrier at the moment is the uh, currency control issue. So we'll see how that works out. I agree with William that free trade is really the best policy and there are other ways to control it. Uh, lots of other things to talk about, but I think we'll cut it off here uh, and go back to the group discussion. Thank you. So I'm going to just take a minute just to go through a couple points that might directly impact uh, inbound investors into the U.S. So the very first one is uh, what you have probably heard, border adjustment tax. So basically, border adjustment tax is a denial on any deduction on goods or services imported into the U.S. Right? For example, you think about all the uh, electronic companies who are selling, like, let's say, iPhones to Apple, right, who are selling laptops to HP. So essentially, on all those imports, they would not be able to get any deduction when they report the U.S. tax. So that could be very substantial, and a lot of the clients that I have talked to and my other partners have talked to is a huge concern for them, right? But of course, like, it's in the proposal. Nothing has been finalized yet, so we will see how it develops, and, and hopefully it, it will be a, like, it will be, it, will, it may not be passed, or it might be just like a phase-in type of uh, tax uh, not affecting uh, all the companies importing goods into, into the U.S. directly that dramatically. And the, the U.S. tax system right now is on a worldwide tax system. And then under the tax reform, it will become a territorial system, meaning only uh, income generated in the, on the U.S. soil would be subject to U.S. tax, right? So for example, um, when it comes to um, tax planning, you know, tax planning 101 tells us that when you have like intellectual property, you do not want to have those in the U.S. You always want your IP to be parked in a foreign jurisdiction. But under the territorial system, it might be like completely different because income from foreign countries to use those IPs in the U.S. might be not subject to U.S. tax at all, right? So that's like a huge change right there. Another issue that uh, is being faced by a lot of the inbound investors is withholding tax. For example, withholding tax on interest payments uh, from a U.S. company to the foreign affiliates. Um, there's not much in the tax reform addressing that area, so we'll see how that develops. So that's like a really uh, a, a quick run through of the major tax reform provisions that might impact the inbound companies. And I just want to wrap up the, the, the discussion with one quick question with, for uh, William and Elizabeth. Because I think right now, a lot of the investments that we see from China are in the real estate sector, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see a change on that trend? I mean, maybe moving from real estate to different sectors? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, we, we definitely see it. Real, real estate is, is, continues to be a major investment, but we see a big shift to other sectors. IT, of course, being number one. Anything that's technology-based is a huge growth area. Um, and financial services is the new one to watch. Pure investment, pure investment, uh, like Mr. Yao's investment in Vanka, as an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nepal. Thank you.